Hey, this is Andy Hubbs. If you want to learn how to use your small axe to build an empire, you should be listening to the Small Axe Podcast with my good friend, Nico. Hey, 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 guys. This is your boy, Nico, your host of the Small Axe Podcast. Hey, this show is dedicated to helping you become the best multifamily real estate investor that you can be. Now, whether you want to be an active or a passive investor, this show will give you all the resources you need to help sharpen your axe and build your own personal empire. So you know what? Sit back and relax and enjoy this show. And hey, if you find value in it, I would love for you to subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. I love you guys. Hey, Small Axe community, it is your boy Nico here, and I am back hanging out with a good friend of mine. His name is Andy Hubs. Now, I met Andy in the Make It Happen Mastermind, the MIH crew, and if you have not heard of them, check them out too, mihmastermind.com. But I want to get Andy on because I, I think he's got a compelling story to tell, a compelling journey, something that you can possibly relate with, and something that you can uh, get advice from. So Andy, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Nico. I've really been excited to, to be on your show. I've been following your podcast. And so it's, it's a real honor. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, man, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Sure. So let's take a minute uh, or two to give the listeners kind of some background of where you came from and how you got to where you are today. Okay. I live uh, just north of Detroit in Shelby Township, Michigan. My wife and I are law partners in a law firm that we started back in 2004. I'm married. Uh, I have three kids. My oldest is a freshman in college. I've got a junior in high school, and I've got a 12-year-old daughter in seventh grade. I've got three golden retriever dogs. And my wife and I started back in 2011 investing in single family. We actually intended to do more fix and flips, but we ended up just acquiring a portfolio of single family properties, kind of holding onto these properties that we were renovating and rehabbing. And so Probably about a year and a half, two years ago, I read an article that Yosef uh, Lee had written that was in Bigger Pockets about one of his first deals. And I reached out to Yosef and had a great conversation with him. And he put me in contact with Marco Barbaro. And so fortunate to be part of the Make It Happen family, that Make It Happen community has been terrific. So in my first full year of multifamily investing, I've done three deals, a little bit of everything. I did an investment in a multi-family fund. Then I also invested as a limited partner in a uh, syndication. And then I got involved in a joint venture. And then I've actually got a, another joint venture that I'm involved in right now. I'll kind of give 2023 credit for that one. But uh, it's been fantastic. Great community and really excited about the opportunity to scale up. Man, Andy, that's amazing, man. Thank you for sharing. So when you were doing the single family stuff, your intention was to fix and flip, but you ended up holding them. Do you still have them? Did you sell any? Well, we have most of them. We had At one point, we had 13 properties. We sold three of them last year, used the proceeds from those to get into these multifamily deals. I've got two more that I'm going to be selling this year. And again, using the proceeds from those to get into some more multifamilies. Uh, one is a JV and possibly some more LP opportunities. And, and then I own uh, 10 out in Indianapolis that are, I'm sorry, it's actually nine now. We did sell one out in Indianapolis that are really, really passive. In fact, I've never actually been to the properties themselves, but I've owned them since 2015. And so in many respects, it's been about as passive as you can possibly invest. So I think those I'm probably gonna hold on to a little bit while longer, but definitely want to make the full conversion from single family to multifamily. I hear you, man. Well, how did you get those ones in Indianapolis? So my CPA is a close friend of mine and he does a lot of real estate investing himself. He actually does some, he's on bigger pockets and just happened to be a next door neighbor at my office to me. And we've become friends. He had a opportunity to speak at an event in Indianapolis back in 2015. And it was going to be with a bunch of investors and he invited me along and we did a bus tour of the Indianapolis market. And uh, at the end of the weekend, he said, what do you think about you and I putting some money together and buying some houses in uh, Indianapolis? 
And I was really excited about it still into this day. We brought in a few more investors and we kind of ended up creating a REIT without intending to create a REIT. It just sort of happened that way. And then over the last several years, I've bought out the interests of a lot of the other investors. So my CPA still has an interest, but I own you know a pretty good percentage of, of those houses. And ultimately, I'll, I'd like to own them all. So it's it's been a, a really good market to invest in. And they're all single family? Are there any duplexes or anything? They're all single family, all throughout Indianapolis. I think we've got one that's in Charlotte. The fellow that we bought him from primarily focuses on Indianapolis, but he does do some investing in the Carolinas and also in Texas. So cool. Do the so I'm assuming you have a, a third party property manager on, on for those? We do. Yeah. We get uh, monthly statements and you know, basically we've just reinvented the rents and have bought more properties from the rents. We've we've never needed the income or used the income. If there are repairs that need to be done, they contact us. They say, hey, you know, you need a new hot water heater or you need this or you need that. We've got somebody. Do we have your permission to, you know, to to hire this person? And so it's very hands off. Awesome. And did you get the opportunity to refinance any of those and pull some cash out? You know, it, that's an option down the road. We've not done that yet. Maybe that ship has sailed. I guess it kind of depends on what <laughs> happens with rates. <laughs> We actually bought them all for cash. So, I mean, we have no encumbrance of any kind, but that's definitely something, you know, long-term that I might look into. So how did you, uh, like you, you have three kids, three dogs, a wife of a law firm. How did you manage all this? No, I've got a wonderful, you're... wonderful wife, a great partner in life. I went to law school with my wife at Michigan state. We got married between our second and third year of law school. My wife is amazing. I mean, her ability to run her practice, she does wills and trusts and probate administration. And I do more of the court stuff. I'm uh, criminal defense and civil litigation. And we've always been a team. You know, we've always found a way to be there for our kids' activities, to, you know, get them to their practices, get them to different events they had, to make sure that we're very active in that regard. And it is a lot of juggling and it is a, a lot of work, but it's been incredible. So I'm very blessed. Great to hear, man. I, so that's really inspirational because a lot of us are thinking, where can we get the time? But I mean, you're you're what you're in it. You run a law firm. I mean, there's just so much that you're doing, and the kids, and the dogs. That there's so much time involved in all that. If you're going to really do it right, that you feel like there's no time left for another business, which multifamily is, and that's where we come to at this point. You kind of left the hands off approach, and then you did some multifamily stuff. I know some of that was. Um, you know, basically hands off too, but you're learning the game, you're in the game, and now you're doing joint ventures. Mm -hmm. right? So, so there's a lot of work involved in that. Do you dedicate time? Do you time block? Or how does that, or does it just organically happen that you find time? Or what do you give up? Excellent question. It is fairly organic at this stage. I am looking to get more active and I'm looking to carve out time that I used to devote to some practice areas in my law practice and to devote that toward more regular time blocks, you know, to do investing. One of my big goals for this year, and I'm fortunate to partner with two ter really terrific guys, great partners, and we all kind of complement each other. But my main focus is going to be to attract capital. I ultimately want to become very proficient at all aspects of real estate investing. And, and I'm excited about everything from nuts to bolts. But one of the things that I, I'm really kind of focusing on is getting some education, finding ways to become more savvy on social media. My partners and I are hosting some dinners. Uh, our first one is the end of this month. And we're going to try to do it at least once a month with friends of ours who you know, are similarly situated, who are looking to uh, passively invest in, in multifamily real estate. As an attorney, I'm in, the, the first dinner is going to be primarily attorney friends of mine who have expressed an interest in multifamily investing. And then about a week later, we're doing one with folks primarily in the medical field. My partner, uh, Eric Tomei, is a physical therapist. And so he has a lot of contacts in the medical field. Uh, I have some, some friends who are in the medical field. And we want to just slowly kind of develop a community of friends and people we know who would seek to take advantage of and to benefit from passive investing, much in the same way that I've done. Um, but... Absolutely. To your point, it's going to take a little bit more uh, time management. And that's that's really kind of my big goal, or as my my older son says, requirement. If you call it a goal, it kind of seems like it's optional. Mm -hmm. But if you say it's a requirement, then that's a little bit more ownership behind it. 
And so that kind of stays with me. So my requirement for 2023 is to devote more regular time to to real estate investing because I really do want to become more active, notwithstanding my my law practice. Wow. Do you ever have any uh, thoughts about leaving the law practice? You know, great question. No, I love practicing law. My mom's an attorney. My uncle's an attorney. My wife's an attorney. I wanted to be a lawyer since I used to go to law school classes with my mom when I was a kid, when she couldn't get a babysitter. And I absolutely positively love practicing law. It's rewarding. It's incredibly stressful. Uh, the gray hairs <laughs> that I do have are are primarily from what I do, but it's more than just what I do. It's, it's kind of who I am. And if anything, I want to find a way maybe to become more selective about the kinds of cases that I take, maybe do some more pro bono work doing criminal defense work, I've really become very passionate about trying to help people get a second chance. Some of the brightest, most talented people, Nico, that I've ever met have been people that I've represented. And I think to myself, if only these folks had a mentor, somebody Mm -hmm. to kind of help out and give them a positive direction, that these same individuals that I'm representing could be doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, they could really change the world. And so if anything, I want to find a way to take uh, maybe a little bit more of an active role in practicing law that not, you know, it's not even nine to five. It's more like a 12 hour commitment, 16 hour commitment every day, and maybe ease up a little bit on the time constraints with that, but to do more to kind of help the community. You know, one of the things, and this happens on, on more than one occasion, I'll be meeting with a client and they'll say, you are the first positive male role model I've ever had in my life. And some of these folks are old enough to be my parent. And I think to myself, that's proof positive that being a mentor, being a positive role model is is really, I think, the key for so many people, not everybody, but for a lot of people. And so I leave it to a lawyer to give a long answer to your short question. But, you know, I'm I plan on practicing for as long as I'm physically able, maybe not in the most traditional sense of the word at all times, but uh, it's what I love to do. So I'm I know a lot of my investor friends want to totally become full-time investors. And that's wonderful. And I admire that. But for me, I, I really have a passion for practicing law. That's amazing, man. Giving back is extremely important and fulfilling for us as people in our personal lives and careers and journeys. And, and that's always something that's on my mind as well, You know, coming from 19 years teaching students. And my original goal or my original thought of becoming a teacher was to help people. I said, you know, why am I going to, why am I getting into this? Because I want to help people because I've seen people struggle, you know, my own family. So my parents got divorced when I was about 12. And then my mom remarried and had five other children. She turned to drugs and subsequently those kids were in and out of foster care. And I was, you know, 15, 16, 17, uh, up to in, into my twenties, really taking on a bigger responsibility and role than because that father had left than what I should have a lot of pressure on me, a lot of stress on me. And I noticed that all I wanted was somebody to help these kids, somebody to give them some sort of hope, some sort of guidance. And that was my reason for becoming a teacher, thinking that I can inner city school in New York City and thinking that I can be a positive role model and have a positive impact. Now, translate that to today, what I'm, what, what goes on in my brain is how can I, and I see it, I, I see exactly what you're talking about. Those people that have made poor decisions but are extremely capable and have a really good entrepreneurial spirit and mind and can certainly be successful in business and in society are left behind because they just don't have that guidance and and encouragement and role models. So my thoughts have led me recently, actually it's been years, I just haven't done anything with it yet and I'm getting closer. My thoughts have led me to think of some sort of program for these kids where it is sponsored by people in our communities, right? Who they sponsor a little bit of money where I then, or we have then a coaching program for those kids to become their, the entrepreneurs that they can be and the investors that they can be and manage their own deals. And I want to start small and then eventually build it up to something big. Absolutely. I mean, you hit it right in the nose. I, I think you and I are pretty similarly aligned. And, and I think to myself, particularly with the criminal work that I do, a lot of these guys, whether they're unfortunately selling drugs or involved in, you know, certain illegal activity, I think to myself, they have the skills to do productive things. They have the skills and the creativity and the organization and the managerial skills. I I, I don't mean to chuckle about it, but it, it's really something that I don't think we we really think about. And and instead of doing something that's illegal and that could be harmful to people, something that's positive 
And, and I know a lot of a lot of cities, and I, I suspect New York is similar to Metro Detroit and, and, and Detroit proper, in that they want to encourage businesses in Michigan. They have grants that are available. A lot of the local universities have programs where they offer classes for, you know, budding entrepreneurs, and they have sort of incubators, and they offer, um, you know, opportunities. And, and I think to myself, along the same lines, take these take these men and women kids in some cases and and just show them a different way and give them the encouragement and the resources and i think the world would be a much better place so yeah man that's awesome i'm inspired now thank you Andy. <laughs> no you thank you <laughs> circling back a little bit you mentioned eric tomei had did you meet him in mih or were you guys friends prior i've known eric for about 11 years um the very first uh single family real estate event I went to um, was at a, a, a restaurant that one of his partners opened. And uh, he just had a lot of mutual friends and uh, we're both big baseball fans. Um, I'm originally from Chicago, so I'm a huge, huge Cubs fan. I'm not quite sure what Eric's connection to the Cubs is, but Eric's always been a big Cubs fan too. <laughs> and so between baseball and real estate, it was just kind of a natural bond. And and then I, I thought to myself, because MIH, I love real estate investing, and I love multifamily investing in particular. And so I thought that Eric would make a, a wonderful addition to MIH. And, and so, you know, I've known him for about, like I said, 10, 11, 12 years. And then we also have a mutual friend that we brought into MIH, Zaid Kassab, uh, who is an incredible inspiration. You know, I what, what may seem maybe impressive in the day-to-day -day that I do, I can't hold a candle to people like Zaid. That, that guy is just a, a powerhouse. And so I'm really lucky to have brought two friends of mine into MIH to a community that means so much to me and, and really see them thrive in that. So that's phenomenal. I haven't met Zeb yet, but you and Eric have very similar uh, personalities where you're both so open and willing to talk and help and, and just positive. You, like you're, you're, I, I just can't. I can't really pinpoint it, but there's a certain vibe that you guys put out that is just encouraging, supportive, and positive. And, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I think that's why we get along so well. And, and so it's, it's great to be able to work with people that you have some things in common with. So cool. All right. So you mentioned, you mentioned JVs are, is Eric and or Zabe involved in any of those? You know, uh, Eric and I have not done, we, we've done a lot of investing sort of independently, but within the same time frame, Zaid and I have independently invested in, in the same JV opportunities and in the same LP opportunities. And, and so what we are really interested in doing, in addition to, you know, providing value to different teams and kind of coming in as a a general partner on some syndications, but also we're, we're interested in opportunities to buy smaller multifamily, you know, with a smaller number of units and kind of keep them in an active portfolio uh, that we keep for a long time. I think Marco Barbaro and Chris Jackson refer to them as sort of legacy properties that we can keep for an extended period of time. And and I'm really bullish on, on the Midwest, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I'm from the Midwest. I see a lot of opportunities, both currently and long-term in the Midwest. And so our goal, amongst other things, like I said, is to kind of keep some properties in our portfolio while still creating value, you know, sort of diversifying by creating value with other teams. And, and there's so many terrific teams. I, I know uh, working with you at some point down the road is, is certainly an aspiration of mine. So, you know, and that's the great thing about a community like, like MIH. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. Now I was pronouncing his name wrong. I said Zabe, but it's Zaid. Thank you for correcting me. Um, <laughs> that's okay. I got to connect with him, man. But so you you know, you mentioned also uh, prior that you're focusing a little bit more on the capital raising side, which would leave you open to a variety of markets you could then raise for a cut for a deal anywhere, your your deal of preference, right? Your deal of choice. But do you focus on any specific markets at this time when you're looking for your own deals? You know, we, we really like uh, Ohio. Being originally from Illinois, I'd, I'd love to do more in Illinois. I do some things with Frank Lamarck, just north of Chicago. And that's been really satisfying to me because I, I, you know, my family has been in Chicago since the very beginning, since 18, you know, early 1800s. And, uh, and so I've always felt a, a link and I was born in Illinois. I like that market. Illinois is not the most investor friendly state by and large. Uh, Indianapolis, like I said, for my single family has been good. And so I'd like to see what that can bring us with uh, multifamily. 
I think Ohio is phenomenal. I think there's a lot of opportunities, not only in, you know, Columbus and Cincinnati and Cleveland, but also in, in some of the, the suburbs. And I was talking to an investor just the other day, and, and this whole notion of primary markets versus tertiary markets, I think is becoming more blurry because uh, there's so much sprawl. So, mm-hmm. you know, you could be 30 minutes south of Columbus and still be part of that Columbus market. I think what's happening is that the the, the footprint that a city like Columbus or Indianapolis or Detroit has, it's spreading. And, and so it's it's almost become more difficult, I think, to find tertiary markets. But the nice thing is that the, the primary markets themselves have spread out. And, and, and I think that's, in my opinion, that's going to be more of a trend where you can be 20, 30 minutes outside of a downtown area and still be part of and still benefit from that primary market. But to answer your question, definitely the the Midwest. Although the LP that I invested in was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And what drew me to that were the people. Um, And I remember Zayd and I were having a discussion and we both decided to invest in that. And we both said, well, not only are the numbers phenomenal, but we're really a big fan of the people who are involved and we believe in the people. We believe in the folks. And that's the, 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 the really satisfying thing about multifamily is it's a team sport and you get a chance to align yourself and, and be a part of a team with people that you admire and that inspire you. And so, you know, we would definitely leave ourselves open to other opportunities as well. Awesome. I have so many questions, but I, I kind of want to ask you about in your LP positions, me and yourself as a general partner, right? What does, I've never invested as an LP in somebody else's deal, just I just didn't have the capital. So I'm curious to know what, as an LP, what you look for in the sponsorship team. You mentioned that, you know, it's a, it, you, you followed the team on this one. You didn't know much necessarily about Oklahoma, but you did it. And yeah, and the team was important too. So what about that makes them stand out? Because the, my listeners are trying to be active investors or are active investors as well. So if we can give them some tips of how to be for their LPs, maybe they can be more successful. Sure. Um, I, I, I What I try to do is I try to talk to people who have previously been involved as LPs, maybe with with the same folks who are dealing, or I'm sorry, sponsoring a deal, and and just kind of get, for lack of a better term, references. You know, what were your experiences? Was the communication there? Were they receptive? I know that it's it's got to be uh, having never been a, a GP before. It's got to be sometimes stressful and, and and frustrating to have to respond to a lot of different folks and 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 deal with different concerns and different issues. The the, the key is communication. And if you have a lot of faith that the uh, members, you know, the, the GPs are going to be good communicators. And, and, and really the main thing for me is I want somebody who is going to be real and say, listen, you know, for whatever reason, either it's the, the, the spike in interest rates or inflation in general, or whatever the case may be, uh, our numbers, we have to, we have to adjust our numbers. You know, we went into this thinking that the equity multiple or the return would be this, we need to adjust that. Or maybe for that first year, uh, we're not going to be able to make distributions, but I think, but I think that's realistic. And I think that happens. And I think that People need to become realists and do a reality check um, and be skeptical. You know, I'm I, with my profession. I'm a skeptic by trade, and 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 so to really do your homework and and to kind of run some numbers and to the extent that you can gain some familiarity with those markets, are these realistic numbers that they're showing me, or is this kind of pie in the sky, or is this somebody who is trying to you know take my money and really doesn't care what happens? And, and and so the the nice thing is being part of a mastermind and being part of a community, with the exception of the fund that I invested in, everybody that I've been investing with have been people who have been in the same community. And I know Marco's done a wonderful job at vetting people and really getting people with, with high integrity into this group. And if you don't have the experience knowing to align yourself with partners who have the experience, who can sort of make up for your lack of experience. I think it's just about finding a team that everybody complements each other with their skill sets. Mm, yeah, very well said, Andy. Thank you. And something that you pointed out is important um, for budding GPs, right? Is the tr- transparency. A lot, you know, we as a business owner, you want to hide the the chaos that goes on behind the scenes, but it's best not to. And people can typically see through that if you're trying to hide something. It's clear, you know. So it's 
important to be transparent and be upfront with the challenges that you're facing, but provide solutions and providing val uh, valid solutions to problems is, is a form of leadership that people respect. So I like that. Um, and there was something else you mentioned. It kind of slips my mind right now. Oh, yes, the communications. And I've found that in communicating with people, some people like different formats. Uh, is there any type of format that you prefer that be that, you know, video, text, or like email or all of the above? You know, to be honest with you, I, I may, and maybe it's the nature of what I do. My favorite form of communication, secondarily to, to you know, speaking on the phone, of course, is, is text. Because I don't always get a chance to look at my emails religiously. I realize that it may not always be practical to text everything. If there's a text with a link on it, um, I, I personally like like texting, and I and I, I think it's terrific. So for me, that's really what it is is texting. Awesome. Okay, Andy. So you mentioned that um, you know you're going to be hosting some events to discuss with doctors and attorneys and about about investing in, mel in multifamily. That's an excellent, awesome way. As you, I think you use the word incubation uh, period or an incubator, right? To get yeah. them you know, ready and primed to invest. Now, that leads me to this question of 2023. Do you have certain goals set for what you want to accomplish? Or are you still kind of building that machine and, and just ready to strike if something comes? Or, or are you very specific with your goals? You know, it, 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 it's, it's, I, I like that question a lot. For me, I, I, I definitely want to take on a more active role. I definitely want to either be part of more JVs and and or to to hold a, a GP position either individually or the the company that Eric and Zaid and I have, which is Top Point Investments, is basically just to take a more active hands-on role. And I think I think in in, in doing that, that's going to lead to just more deals. I've always been somewhat reticent about saying, well, I want to I want to have another four hundred doors or another two hundred doors. For me, I don't know if that so much works. Because I don't want to limit myself. And I also don't want to disappoint myself if we get 125 doors, as an example, or, or less than that, but they're good quality investments. I think it's more about just becoming a better craftsman, so to speak, at real estate investing and building a, building a reputation and becoming more proficient in my roles. And I think with that, a lot of the goals that I have, uh, as far as you know, investing goes, will kind of fall into place. Awesome, man. I love it. Now, I want to transition to our final question, but I want a different question that just popped up in my head. For somebody getting started, think about yourself when you were beginning your journey. Do you have any invite, any advice? It could be any kind of advice for somebody getting started on their multifamily journey. They're excited to get in. They really are passionate about it. Maybe what could you say to them? I really and truly would, and and you know I'm I'm sure that there are a lot of wonderful ones out there. I happen to get very lucky. And, you know, I, I think I kind of came to the table with a little bit of single family uh, investing experience, which helped. But by the same token, uh, even if you don't have that, join a mastermind, join a community. I find with real estate investing, in particular, multifamily investing, people are so generous with their time and, and their, their knowledge. And so rather than try to reinvent the wheel, you know, Tony Robbins talks about if you want to be successful, you see people who are successful and you, you do the same things. Success leaves habits. And so um, I think you can you can see that success in becoming part of I'm sorry multifamily mastermind. Oh, Andy, awesome man, great advice. Okay, let's do it. We're going to transition to our final question, and be careful. This is a doozy, man. So let's imagine it was 100 years from now. You have great great grandchildren, and at, by this point, you have 48 dogs as well running around. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this community that you left behind wants to write a book about you. What would you want them to title this book? I, I love that question. That, that's such a, an excellent question. I, I would say exception to the rule. And, and, and the reason I say that is I think that so many people have preconceived notions. I've certainly learned not to or to do that less frequently to preconceived notions to, to be more open minded. You know, for myself, sometimes people look at me and they say, I can't believe you're a criminal defense attorney. You look like a you look like you do tax like you're a tax attorney. You look like an accountant. Um, or you're, you're too much of a nice guy to be an attorney. And so when I say exception to the rule, I mean the, more in air quotes rather than literally in that, you know, you've really got to keep an open mind and, and that not everything, you can't really make generalizations about people. Like I said, an exception to the rule would be finding these, these young folks that I represent and seeing the potential they have. They're an exception to maybe uh, preconceived notions we have about the criminal justice system. 
And so I like to think of them as exceptions to the rule. And there really are so many exceptions to the rule. That's why we air quote it. It's more colloquial. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of how I try to live my life is to keep an open mind, uh, to not be somebody that you can you can guess what he's going to do, to kind of think outside the box and to sometimes find creative ways to do things. I don't really consider myself to be a renegade or a, or a crusader necessarily, but you know, I'm kind of a work in progress. And I don't know, the, the title just, I think, seems kind of catchy to me. <laughs> I think it's great, man. It's very well well said and well well fitting for you. I think you're a wonderful dude, man. And I'm really inspired by you and your story and your journey and, and just getting to talk to you today and getting even talk. So I'm going to be honest here. I talk to a lot of people on shows, but I don't necessarily get the same vibe that I'm getting with you. I feel calm. I feel comfortable. I don't feel intimidated. And there is a level of expertise in your tone that makes me feel just like I can, I can talk with you all day and, and there's no reservations in anything that I can ask you. It's just you're like an open book and a, just a good person, man. Well, I feel the same way, Nico. I, I am so honored to be a part of the show today and uh, you've done exceptional things and you're, you're one of the many people I think about when I think about the folks in, in the mastermind who have, have helped me out and who have been an inspiration. So thank you. This has been a great honor. Oh man. Okay, Andy, you're the best. We're going to keep chatting. Now, how can people reach out to you if they want to chat with you? Well, uh, I actually have a very open book policy, surprise, surprise, <laughs> when it comes to my cell phone number. Call me 248-891-1692, or my email address is andy at hubslaw, H-U-B-B-S, L-A-W dot com. And uh, I can be reached at either one of those, those forms. Wonderful. Thank you, Andy. Let's crush 2023, my friend. Let's make it happen. Hey, Small Axe community. I would like to say thank you for listening to another episode of this podcast where we show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. Now, if you like what you heard, it would mean the world to me if you could leave me a five-star rating and write a written review. Hey, let's take it one step further and share this podcast with someone that you feel could benefit from it. And until the next episode, keep sharpening those axes.